Greetings, Parish Orphans and Retrogrades. Timothy Gordon here with an installment of Rules for Retrogrades today. I'm excited to bring to you America's top conservative comic, uh, according to the well-earned uh, repute of many, many of our best thinkers, Mr. Evan Sayet, who is the best, according to Ann Coulter, uh, the top conservative comedian around. You can check his credentials. They're impeccable. Mr. Sayet, thank you for joining us here today. You How know, are you? There's, there's actually video of me doing it, so they can they can go check for themselves. I've got an hour long special that's available on Amazon Prime for free if you've got Amazon Prime. As a matter of fact, go watch my special. It's called uh, Evan Say It, a deplorable mind, and Timothy. That's the fastest I've ever gotten to a plug ever. <laughs> I, that's what we do here, man. We uh, we're, we're that's what deplorables do. We're we're grifters. All my detractors out there call call me a grifter. Selling my books, selling my stuff, and I, I like to look out for. I got you six if you're a fellow grifter. So what's up? Go check out Evan Say It on Amazon Prime. Uh, he, he's got a deplorable mind, and what that means is you're a threat to the liberals because you got a a, a rapier wit or as a ra a rapist wit, as Jim Car Carrey says in Dumb and Dumber, and you know how to put into practice rule for retrograde number five. Reese's Bellum Est, the idea that, that laughter is war. There's no defense against it. We don't have enough conservative comedians. I, I don't mean to, but it's also Saul Alinsky who points out that ridicule is the most powerful weapon of all. And, that's and, right. and by the way, that's the reason I actually got back into stand-up after all those years, because as you and I were discussing uh, off the air, um, I used to write television shows, and prior to that, I did my stand-up. When my kids were born, I didn't want to be on the road 40 weeks a year. Uh, but when I discovered that I'm really a conservative, that my liberal values, lowercase l, liberal values that I always thought were in the Democratic Party, because I grew up a New York City-born liberal Jew who worked in Hollywood. But when uh, it, it dawned on me that my true values are on the right, I said, what tool do I possess? What weapon can I bring to this culture war that our side doesn't seem to have? And the answer was a stand-up comedian. We didn't have a Bill Maher for the right. Right. And, and as we were talking before we started, you used to right work for Bill Maher. You're a Hollywood insider. You know how the sausage is made, which yeah. makes everyone want to go. I never sausage, right? sausage and Bill Maher in the same sentence, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Too many stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, look, I want to get to a, a second or third plug for you right away. You just released the woke supremacy an anti-socialist manifesto sounds kind of like rules for retrogrades less than 36 hours ago. Congratulations on getting any book accomplished. Yeah, my, as, my, my son said to me, no, it must be very difficult to write a book. I said, are you kidding? It's easy to write a book. It's hard to write a good book. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Hard to, hard to write a punchy, pithy, well-sourced book. But, hey, you feel good if you get one done, uh, win, lose, or draw. Congratulations! What to tell? We'll, we'll we'll do this in reverse the entire interview. Where can people go find that? Well, at Amazon.com, everything's Amazon. You can actually get a date with me on Amazon. There's everything's Amazon now, uh, unfortunately. But that's 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 where it is. Amazon.com. I mean, if you want to click on my website first, EvanSayIt.com, you can then click on Amazon.com. But anyway, <laughs> that's where you'll end up uh, if you want to buy my book. What kind of date can they get with you? Is this uh, dinner or dinner and a movie or dinner and a movie and uh, maybe a bowling? All right. Why don't you uh, have to back to the show to answer that question? I'm going to start a GoFundMe account so I can afford to take somebody on a date. And uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> listen, I'm only, I, I've been pent up like everybody else, not allowed to leave the house. I'm in Las Vegas, but there's no strip. It's all closed down. Uh, actually, it's one of the reasons I, I was able to write this book so quickly is because what else was there to do? That's right. That's right. I'm, I'm writing two this summer. Well, as my, my fans know, I got canceled at the beginning of the summer and I spent the rest of the summer moving and making plans and all that. But I, I'm, I, I'm on contract for, for two books, one with Tan, one with Sophia, and I got to spend my fall doing that, man. So congratulations. But let me. Here's what I want to ask you about. You are uh, the top, top conservative comedian According to all the people who know, Tammy Bruce, even oh, my friend, Jazz McKay. Look, it's undeniable. You ever see me work, it, you don't even question it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm not gonna. I'm. I'm not questioning it. I'm telling the people out there. I've watched a lot of your content, and I didn't even realize it was you until I went back and kind of synced up name and face. I watched a lot of your content around. You know, some of the stuff around post 9/11, and some of the stuff around 12, 2012, 2013, 2014. A couple things point out to me. I'm going to quote you to you. I love when people do this to me. You say everything that they Hollywood liberals and the liberals writ large, everything that they believe is designed by one criterion, one criterion of truth. Does it tear down what is good and elevate what is wrong in terms of the true, the good and the beautiful? Can you explain what you mean there? Yeah, I mean, my the, the talk that, that you're referring to, the post 9-11 was really my first foray into conservative thinking because I'm not just a comedian. I'm also rather well known for my serious lectures, my serious talks, my lecture at the Heritage Foundation, which is one of the things you're probably referencing. Andrew yeah. Breitbart called at the time one of the five most important conservative speeches ever given. And it's because I analyze how the modern liberal thinks. That's That was the original. It's now morphed into how the woke think which right. is why this book is The Woke Supremacy. At the heart, the, the, the modern liberal, that's anybody born after World War II and, and getting worse with each successive generation, was raised to believe that indiscriminateness is a moral imperative because its opposite is discrimination. Right? They need to believe that everything, every culture, every religion, every form of governance, every gender, every behavior is equally good and equally right. Well, in order to come to that conclusion, they have to tear down what is in fact better and they have to overvalue, elevate in esteem and stature everything that is in fact lesser. And so mm. if you look at you know, two examples, how do you look at, at Ferguson, Missouri and know the facts but decide that, that Michael Brown was gunned down in cold blood? Because it had to be. Because if he, if he was guilty then he's not as good. His behaviors aren't right. There always has to be somebody to blame for somebody else's failure because it can't be because of their behavior, because of their familial construct that they grew up without a father. It can't be for any reason because that might just be your own thinking. The modern liberal was raised to believe that thinking is an act of bigotry. Absolutely. What, I was saying this to a friend the other day. I'm, I'm going to push back a little bit, though. I think I think you would agree that that the neoliberals, because both of us know that the classical liberals aren't aren't what no, the modern or neoliberal. I, I, neoliberals, I'm a lowercase l liberal. I, sure. I'm a classical. Liberal. We know, like I'm, liberty. I'm not yes. so far right as I am anti left. Of course, I, I'm not a right wing fanatic. I'm an anti left wing fanatic. Well, I'm a right wing fanatic, but but even then, oh, you know, I like liberty, and there's a there's a distinction um, advocated really clearly, crisply, and and perfectly by Thomas Aquinas number one doctor of the church, between liberty and license. They're two close cousins, which are really foibles, right? Rightly ordered freedom is liberty, and wrongly ordered or, or disordered freedom is license. And they're actually opposites, probably the two opposites in the ontological order of things that are the most mistakable for one another. Well, anyway, so I, and if you look at the French Revolution versus our revolution, they had the same concepts, but in the wrong order. And, and you sure. can... And you can see the difference in their history and in our rather stable, rather progressing uh, history of 200 and what is it? Don't make me do the math. It's almost a quarter of a millennia. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's almost a quarter of a millennia. You know, how many governments has France had o over this period or since World War II and, and us in a quarter of a millennia? And that's because we, we had it in the right order. You can't have liberty and equality. Because sure. if I'm free to choose my behaviors, I might be slothful and you might be, uh, you know, you might be hardworking. Uh, you might choose to, to, to pursue a, a high paying profession, whereas I might choose more artistic profession. Once you have freedom of choice, equality goes out the window. Sure. Yeah, you can only have one, one goal in a basketball game, either you, you, equality of opportunity, which you know, start the game zero zero so that and you keep playing so that you achieve the end, which is a disparity of points in the end. Or you could work the other way. Start out uh, with with refs calling the game for the weaker team so that you can get a tie. They're, they're, they're two totally, totally opposite approaches to culture and government. Or you could just embrace soccer and, and nobody scores. <laughs> yeah. A Marxist sham, as Laura Ingram once called it. My, my friend uh, uh, Michael Knowles 
you know, he does a whole thing on soccer and it's, it's great. Yeah. No, nobody wins. No, it's zero, zero at the end. <laughs> because Michael Knowles is a good friend of mine, right? An LA boy. Um, and I have a whole thing on soccer about how it's the stupidest sport in the history of the world. I mean, God gave man two advantages over the beast, right? He gave us a superior mind and an opposable thumb. Opposable. I knew you're going opposable right? thumb. So, yeah. so, I don't so they, they don't use their hands and they hit the ball with their heads. Right. Right. <laughs> problem with the rest of the world is that they're concussed from the time they're five years old they're hitting this rock with their head that's right that's right and when, when i lived in italy when i was beginning a, a doctorate at a pontifical school there i would go into the bars usually with with priests you know we'd, we'd be taking a pint after classes and I'd, I'd look at the score in the soccer game and i'd be like huh that's cute. What's the score? Zero, zero. And they'd be like, yeah. And then I'd look up 45 minutes later. I'd be like, let me guess, zero, zero. And they'd, and they'd start getting pissed. And they'd say, oh, it, you know, they knew I liked basketball. And they'd be like, what's the score in basketball? Like a million to a million? And I'm like, no. Well, here's the thing, man. In basketball, particularly in a playoff game, the score might be 100 to 98. But no one's bored. Every single score is big. You just get 200 times more scores than in a soccer game. But every you're never like... Fourth quarter, tight playoff match. You're never like, oh, my team got a bucket, but who cares? It doesn't hold. It's the point of diminishing returns. They argue they're wrong. And, and if you think about it, soccer is the largest, it's the biggest goal in, in all of sports, and they still can't find it. Right? <laughs> yeah, Basketball's true. a tiny little hoop, 10 feet in the air, and they find it 100 times a game. Right. right? But, but soccer's right. the biggest goal in all of sports, even hockey. Right. And they're on skates, they're on ice and they find the gold now and then. It's all, right. it's only soccer. And, and that's why the rest of the world embraces soccer. And, and we don't. It's just we don't like games where where you don't score. We were objective or objective oriented. Objective. That's right. Mm -hmm. but it's, it's the Harrison Bergeron of sports. Like you said, you can't use the opposable thumbs. All the other sports you're using your hands. Look, I want to I, I want to get to this this point. I think you'll like it. What it regards that first quote of yours I read to you. And here's something I missed. This is what I was remarking to a friend the other day. The neoliberals, who are really just Saul Linsky's radicals, uh, no longer camouflaged, demasked, no pun intended. They uh, now, they've uh, uh, dropped let's, let's, the let's, relativism. They, let, they, let, that's correct. It's, I'm sorry, but let, let's do this. They, they took off the masks because... This is, you're exactly right. What happened was that the radicals of the 60s, who were the founders of the democratic socialist movement, uh, sought to foment revolution. They, they declared war. Bernadine Dorn, uh, one of the weather underground terrorists, William Ayer's wife, right. uh, said, hi, I'm Bernadine Dorn, and I'm going to read to you a declaration of war. And they tried to get people to join them, but they couldn't. Because the people who were in America at that time had seen socialism, whether they had fled from the Nazis or whether they fled from Stalin or were sent overseas to fight these things. And when they came back, they didn't want a socialist revolution. They, they saw what socialism is in just a slightly different context. And this is in my book. Muhammad Ali went to train for a big fight in, 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 in Zaire, Africa. He went over to Africa. He set up his training camp there and he spent a month. And, and when he came home, they said to Muhammad, now this is a black man from the Democratic Party controlled South who had long ago already converted to Islam. He said, Muhammad, what did you think of the, an the, the continent of your ancestors? And he said, quote, thank God my granddaddy got on that boat. Yeah. And so there was nobody who wanted to overthrow America. So when their revolution failed, they went underground. They went into what's called the, the long march through the institutions. They took over academia and education. They took over entertainment and, 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 and news. Now right. they control uh, social communications. And they created their own social justice warriors the same way Hitler created Hitler Youth, the same way that, that, that Lenin created the young revolutionaries, the same way the madrasas do in the right. Islamist nations. And Mark Rudd, just a really awful, disgusting human being. I mean, he, he, he said, it must be wonderful to, to kill a pig, a cop. Um, and he incited children to murder their parents. He said, the true flowering of the 60s will come in the 90s when we've taken over the institutions. And he was wrong only because he missed the obvious. They would need one more generation that they would use those institutions to brainwash. Right. So they need another 30 years. So from the 60s to the 90s is 30 years. What's the 90s and another 30 years? 
2020. This is why they've taken off the masks. This is why they're no longer, this is why they're calling themselves socialists again. They're not hiding it. You know, this is why it's the same rhetoric, the same cop killing, the, the same uh, uh, quasi independent terror groups. Uh, it's, it's all, this is the fruition of, of, of the revolution that they sought to sow in the 60s and failed and told us they were going to do. The, the poet Allen Ginsberg said to Norman Potharitz, we'll get to you through your children. Right, right. It's the biological solution in, in reverse. In, you know, I'm Roman Catholic. We're, we're going to outbreed them the way that, that European secular humanists are being outbred by Muslims in Europe. That's, that's what we need to, to do is bring old-fashioned bio-solution to the shores in America. That's actually, that's actually part of the date that I was offering later. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Have a bunch of little, that's included uh, in the package. Yeah, the society, a bunch of Syed bastards running around. Evan, say it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Now they got to be as as you know. Your your friend Larry Elder is the one that points out. Now they got these have to be fathered, sired, legitimate kids have to be part of it. So your your date option on Amazon, notwithstanding its um, you know your generosity, it, this doesn't count. We need. It won't fathered, cut. mothered children, you know, you know, six, seven, eight, eight That's kids strong per family. I ever do is good enough for you, Timothy. I try. I put it out there. I right. got exacting standards. What can I, what can I tell you? No, here's, here's, I, I don't think you'll disagree with me because you accurately captured the essence of the age in the 90s and the early 2000s when you said everything they believe is geared around tear down what's good elevate what's evil but other than that they they purported they professed a kind of relativism you know we don't really care what you do tupac shakur only ju god can judge me everyone you know right everyone live your own way we don't really care just we don't like that that you know christians are out there telling people how to live that's what they said for a while you're really you're it, it, what's apropos of what you just said three minutes ago it, the other part of the damasking that no one is calling out is that they're done with that worldview now. That that fake pseudo relativism. Friedrich Nietzsche says there's really no such thing as relativism. You're always going to impose an ought for any is, and you can tell that they're done with the relativism when you walk out and about without a mask. Now all of a sudden, all the brown shirts that you're talking about are running around like, "Where's your mask, dude? You're wearing it wrong." This that. It's like, hey, man. Just, just you go live your way. I, I march to the tune of a different drummer. They're done with it, aren't they? they, they yeah, they. But they, they are done with it because they don't need it any longer. And I'm sorry, right. it was, it was supposed to be this even-handedness that they were seeking. And, and how can you argue against the even-handedness? But it never was. I mean, that was sort of the uh, transition period from those who loved America being the mainstream population to where they've gotten us now, uh, which is the, the generation after generation indoctrinated in, into this cult of, of, of leftism, of wokeism. You know, and the, and the irony, of course, uh, is, is that they're the ones who are not woke. They're, their eyes are closed to reality because they have to, they have to conclude ahead of time that nothing is better than anything else. And if nothing is better than anything else, then why does something succeed? If America isn't better than these other nations, then how did we get so rich? There's only one explanation. If we're not better, we must have stolen it. And, 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 and that's where they wanted to get us in the first place anyway, because the idea is to foment revolution. It's not to, it's, it's not to find a solution. It's not to ameliorate situations. It is simply to foment a, a, a revolution. And you can't do that with, with relativism, because with relativism, everybody's equally right. They don't want us to be equally right. They want us to be so wrong that they will overthrow the government as it is. I thought the final institution to be stormed was the Roman Catholic Church. That's definitely the crown gem, and I'm, that's one of the books I'm writing now, is the 200-year story of their infiltration of Masons and Marxists into, into the Vatican itself, all the way through the Curia, into the, the magisterium of the Church. But chronologically, that's wrong. I think Chronologically speaking, the very final institution I see the, the Marxists, particularly the feminist Marxists, invading is that of sports. I was mm -hmm. watching a hilarious little write-up pushing the WNBA, which is like 23 seasons 
you know, never, never to make a profit, never to make a dollar profit because it's, it's horrible. It's horrible stuff. They're pushing female sports. Right. But I do believe that this year they're actually going to score a basket. (laughs) No, you're wrong. That's, that's, (laughs) they have to practice for like 10 more years. They might hit a bucket. No, you should go watch it on YouTube. It's really great. It's just back to back. WNBA dunks, they're like slam dunks where they, they barely get it in and the ball rattles around. And these are like highlights versus, you know, NBA where you get freaking Jason Richardson getting jumped over mm-hmm. <laughs> on dunks. But, you know, you, you won't know this name, but there was a basketball player before your time named Pooh Richardson. Oh, no, uh, I know. On the okay. Timberwolves. Well, back yeah. when I was writing the Arsenio Hall show, you know, I was uh, the voice of black America for, for, for two years. Um we used to play basketball with some of the people in the NBA. He was close with, with Magic Johnson, Arsenio was, and uh, I actually stuffed Pooh Richardson. Now, I'm five foot six. He's not. He's six two. I didn't stuff yeah. him at, at the top of his jump. I did what I do, which is stuff you at the bottom of your jump. So yeah. it's so funny to watch this guy flying through the air with no basketball and humiliated <laughs> and That's nothing funny. to do but fly through the air until he lands. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, yeah. Pooh was, uh, I think he was an all-star one year. I'm like an NBA historian, man. Jerome Pooh Richardson for the Minnesota Timberwolves. He, he he made it to the all-star game one year, I believe. So you stuffed an all-star I did indeed. player. Yeah. Well, hey, you know what? According to the relativism that is always, early, this is what we're talking about, early stage, stage one Marxism in the invasion, they use, to borrow your term, they employ the relativism, and then then it's no longer good to them. And it's like, well, of, of course, you know, the WNBA is a joke. No one wants to watch this. Why, why would anyone want to watch it? It's just transitional. It's it's a necessary it transition from leading us to um, uh, from where we are to, to where they want us to be. So it's, you know, equality amongst women. Well, okay, yeah, the, 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 we had the equal rights uh, uh, movement of the, of the 60s and 70s, but it didn't stop, it didn't stop, it didn't stop. And now men are toxic. You know, right. so they, they, they rode with us as we corrected some wrongs that we did have in our history, uh, old world things that were left over when the new country was started. Um, but as we got to e- equality and said, OK, this is what we agreed to. They continued on to flip flop it. They're just as racist as they always were. But right. now, it, in fact, in, in the book, The Woke Supremacy, I talk about the origins of this. And when the, the 60s radicals kind of came out of nowhere And they were not affiliated with any political party. They chose to affiliate with the Democratic Party, which was the party of of the South, of segregation, of George Wallace, of slavery, and not with the party of emancipation and and, and women's suffrage. And why? Because they were racist then. They they didn't care if if racism was whites hating blacks or as with Malcolm X and, and today blacks hating whites. Just so long as there was hatred, because their goal was to foment a revolution. In fact, again in the book, The Woke Supremacy, at the very first meeting of William Ayer's terror group, the the, the Weather Underground, took place in Flint, Michigan in 1969. They took a moment, and the whole room cheered Charles Manson. Wow, really? Yeah. I've never heard that. Yep, because he, he was hoping for Helter Skelter, which is a giant race riot, a race war. And that was pretty much William Ayer's desire from there was pretty much the radicals desire. And it remains the democratic socialist desire to, to rub raw the source of discontent in the black neighborhoods to, to, and, and then see whites pitted against blacks, Asians, to to just see chaos. And from the chaos, they, they intend to uh, rise because they are the ones who are already organized. You have to admit this, though. There is skin color, race-based privilege existent that's, that's undeniable. You see running rampant through the streets when, during the middle of a quarantine, people, because of their skin color, right. they get to go around and set things on fire. Right. Ain't there? You know, which really <laughs> bothers me because it contributes to global warming. Right. Right? right. <laughs> they shouldn't be light fires. Now we've yeah. only got nine years left because of them. Yeah, bastards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, you if you believe it's anthropogenic, <laughs> right. Then. So what what's uh what, how long did you you said you finished this book woke woke supremacy uh, very quickly? How, uh, what's very quickly for Evan? Say it. How long did this well, thing take you? Well, 
I, I got the idea for it right at the beginning of the riots and, and the lockdown. So what are we talking, March, April, when, when they started for real? And it dawned on me, you know, when I first got into the conservative thought industry and, and, and I recognized there were two kinds of writers on our side, it seemed. There were those who chronicled the wrongs of the left and did it in, in, in red meat fashion and very easily accessible to the masses. You know, Sean Hannity's books, and I don't say this with any, uh, those, they're necessary, they're important, and they're, they do their job. Uh, but the Sean Hannity's and the Ann Coulter's and, and, and the uh, Michelle Malkin's who would provide. The, and then there were the ones who did what I wanted to do, which is to discuss the philosophy and the ideology but they yes. tend to be less accessible in their language. I'm thinking Alan Bloom and the closing of the American mind. And even Thomas Sowell, who, who still writes in, 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 in a more academic way. And yes. so I, I felt like I could bridge that gap between being accessible with the language because I've always been a writer uh, for, the, for the purpose of entertainment. You know, I've always known how to, to be, be accessible to, to an audience that isn't just there for the you know, for the, for the academic nature. And I think when I gave my speech to the Heritage Foundation, that's what made it go viral. Uh, not just viral, it was the single most viewed lecture in their entire history. Uh, when I wrote my article, He Fights, which is the single most read article in Town Hall's history. And now with the woke supremacy, I, I think that I'm able to take this understanding. It's not enough to know they do bad things. We know that, all right? We, we know. I don't need to see one more example. I don't need to be have the examples laid out in front of me. But the right. question is why? Because, you know, I mean, the very first rule of warfare is know thy enemy. Right. And, and I realized I don't think we know who the woke are. Uh, so I sat down and wrote this as a manifesto. I wrote this as a, a primer almost. Uh, and, and, I, and I think I achieved it. I think Amen. I achieved it. And, that, and the reviews say so. Amen. I, I, my thing is, we quit laughing. Conservatives out there are, oh, they say, oh, you know, radicals are so objectionable. Their ideas are so obviously false. Ha ha. You're like the kid that snickers when you're getting 50 pieced, man. Mm -hmm. They took the news and entertainment media, they, they, they stormed the institution of the academy, they stormed the institution of primary school they storm the institution of sports now even the church the crown gem they have positions scary. of political and econ quit uh, laughing they're 50 piecing us I, I tell you what scares me the most is that they now have uh the corporate world right and, and when the corporate world has decided that there's more money to be made in lying uh, and and because they're lie filled narratives you know, right. there's nobody who actually knows football who doesn't know that colin kaepernick by the end was was not even a second string player. Yeah. He, he, yeah. he he literally there's a video that I pop up every once in a while and Google it everybody or, or look for it on YouTube and it, it under um, the Rams the Rams disrespect Ka Kaepernick and you watch this play where the Rams don't even defend the wide receivers they just run because they know that he's not going to throw the ball downfield so that means he might get hit. By right. the end, he was not what he was for that season and a half that made him famous. Sure, yeah, yeah, really, really. One one playoffs made him famous, and That's and there there are explanations why he had easy run through the playoffs, uh, whatever whatever season that was. And, and if you go down playoffs. every season after that, he inherited a Super Bowl caliber team. You know, he came in in the middle of the season after I, I don't remember who it was. I think it might have been Alex Smith uh, went down, was injured, uh, and he came in and. They went to the Super Bowl. They lost in the Super Bowl. For the next year, they lost in the playoffs. And the year after that, they didn't even make the playoffs. And by the time they finally benched him, we're only talking a five-year career. Compare that to Brady. Compare that to, to people who don't get injured. You know, Aaron Rodgers, people who have a full career. He, he, he was only five or six years in the league. Every year, significantly worse record than the year before. And he ended up 4-12, and 12, having started with a Super Bowl cal uh, caliber team. Right. Never, never once having made the Pro Bowl. I don't think. I don't think he's ever a Pro Bowler, and, and he never, never deserved to be, even the the good season. Well, hey man, I mean, Roger Goodell's uh, apologizing now and reversing course and saying, so, "So, I look, I love the NFL, I love the NBA, but, and I'm not a big boycott guy. That's not the first place I go because I, I do. You need to unplug, recharge, and the, I do it through NBA and especially NBA and NF, NFL, but." This season, I can't do it. I, after no, after the 
And here's what I suggest your, your, your viewers and your listeners do in that case. Um, turn off the TV, turn off the sports. I've got a new book. <laughs> you know, sure. Read my book, go watch my video, and then all of a sudden the pandemic's over and you go out and play. Right. And the, the rain clears. Cats yep. and dogs can live together in harmony. Uh, you know? Yeah, yeah. You get can change my Coke, my Pepsi to Coke. Uh Hey, man. All right. Well, so, you know, once again, tell them about I'm going to read the full title here. It's not only the woke supremacy. There's the subtitle, an anti-socialist manifesto. You can get this thing online. I'm sure you can get it in any good book hawker near you. Evan, say it. Uh, final thoughts, sir. Just the reason that this book is different because, you know, there are a number of books on socialism out, e even new ones that are out by people I adore and Dinesh D'Souza. Uh, and he does a great job with his book. But this book is, is the one that explains to you how they think. Because if you just say they're evil, well, you know what? My cousin isn't evil. And if you just say they're stupid, you know what? My cousin isn't stupid. It's just not satisfying. It's not the right answer. There's actually a thinking behind their rejection of thinking. And, and this book, The Woke Supremacy, gives you that. I don't know how many more examples of the left being wrong you need. You know, I used to go to these events. David Horowitz's Freedom Center had these events called Recre um Restoration Weekend. And right. at a certain point, I wouldn't even go into the rooms to listen because I got it. You know, we're good, they're bad, let's fight. Right? I get it with the leftists. We're good, they're bad, let's fight. But you need to know why. You do. You need to know why. It's the only right. way you can win them over. Yeah, until you understand why they are the way they are, you also struggle to understand why they're beating us so bad. It's really... Where our, our, our teleology, our telos, our goal is good. Theirs is bad. But everything else, their methodology is good. They're good. We stink. They win. We lose. They are all the institutions they took. We gave them up. Well, partly because we've allowed them to control the, you know, we, we don't do well in the communications aspect. Well, because they own communications. They, they're the ones who shadow ban and they're the ones who put us in Facebook jail and they're the ones who, who decide what information gets out there. You know, we don't, we, we don't have enough good comedians. Well, where are they supposed to work? You know, they, they're not going to be on the Tonight Show. They're not going to be on the, the Jimmy Kimmel or, or uh, Stephen Colbert's show. Where, where are they supposed to get famous? Where are they supposed to... So part of it is that we seeded things that we shouldn't have seeded, and we need that's, to take them back. And man. I, I, I'm not sure that's going to be able to be peacefully done. Uh, but we need, we need to take those things back. I'm not so sure we're as bad as 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 others. In, you know, obviously you're not the first to say that. Um, I don't think we're as bad. One thing we are bad at, though, is 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 our rich people don't support us like their rich people do. Yeah. You know? And yeah. that, that's a shame because if you do want to jumpstart something like a, 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 another drudge or another Twitter or another this, you can't do it as, as a layman. You need financial backing. Amen. Amen. Well, look, you, you got other interviews to do to, to go uh, hawk this book, fellow, fellow book peddler. And I've appreciated your time. The book is uh, The Woke Supremacy, and I'm happy it's out. You sound like you are going to sell a million copies. Evan well, so, Thank so, you. so far, we're on the way. Thank you so much, Timothy. Good to see you. God bless you. Good to see you, too.